Ramadan, oh Ramadan, month of mercy you are, welcome Ramadan. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولقد آتينا موسى الكتاب فاختلف فيه ولولا كلمة سبقت من ربك لقضي بينهم وَإِنَّهُمْ لَفِي شَكٍّ مِّنْهُ مُلِيبٌ وَإِنَّ كُلَّ لَمَّا فينهم ربك أعمالهم إنه بما يعملون خبير فاستقم كما أملت ومن تاب معك ولا تقوم إنه بما تعملون بصير ولا تركنوا إلى الذين ظلموا فتمسكم النار وما لكم فتمسكم سكم النار وما لكم من دون الله من أولياء ثم لا تنصرون وأقم الصلاة طرف النهار وزلفا من الليل إن الحسنات يذهب نسل سيئات (تصفيق) 
فاصبر فإن الله لا يضيع أجر المحسنين صدق الله العظيم uh, One of the amazing things about uh, the night time is that the night time is very special whether you're a believer or not. One of the things that psychologists often discuss is that um, nights are usually uh, considered a spiritual time. So they talk about how usually people are more willing to share uh, and they're usually more in touch with their feelings and their emotions at night. And this is why you see uh, when people go out on dates and stuff like that, when, are, when do they usually go out? During the day or at night? Um, so people are more likely to be in touch with their spiritual side uh, and their feelings and their emotions and what Islam does is that it takes advantage of this time so while other people are busy doing every, every other things uh, a believer takes that spiritual time and they take that emotional time and they devote it to their Lord and one of the things that the scholars often talk about is that the night is a testimony of a person's love so whatever a person loves you'll see that they'll usually devote their night to that. So if a person's only concern in life is to have fun and party and maximize pleasure, they'll spend their night trying to do that. If a person's concern is their afterlife and their love for Allah, then they'll spend their night in concern about their akhirah. And they'll spend their night devoted to Allah Azza wa Jalla. As Allah Azza wa Jalla said, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ That those who believe they're stronger in their love for uh, Allah Azza wa Jal. It's no secret, it's no surprise that uh, our ummah today, our nation today, is not doing too well. And I hate to be negative, I hate to be you know, negative about issues, but this is just a reality. And the point isn't for us to become depressed and say, we're a goner and there's nothing we can do. The point is, how do we bring ourselves out of this situation? And how do we become like the companions of the Allah And this is why one of the things that is often said by the classical scholars and even scholars of our time is that if we want to rectify this ummah, if we, want to if we really, really care about this ummah, we really want to change this ummah, then we, we will not be able to do it except that which changed the beginning of this ummah. I Meaning if we really care, we really, we really want the ummah to progress. Now we're Muslims living in the West and we care about Muslims in America. And we really want Muslims to be in a better state then we have to look at the sunnah of the Prophet and how the companions did it. And it is in that that we're going to find uh, our, our ummah come to life. And the thing about the companions, like I mentioned, is that what they had and what is missing from, from our time is that, that attribute of going above and beyond uh, the bare minimum. Ibn Abbas, Ibn Abbas he says about the companions, he said, I did not see a single companion. He said, I did not see a single companion except that they would take something from the night. Meaning they would pray some type of Qiyam al-Layl. And one of the questions, one of the most off questions I get from young people is, you know what, my Iman is just not doing too well. Like I have a dip in my Iman and I just don't feel it anymore. Or a lot of times people who start practicing Islam, they'll have this Iman high and they're doing really, really well and then a time will come where, where they'll be like, you know, it just doesn't feel the same anymore. Or a lot of times reverts and converts will say, when I first became Muslim, it was the most amazing experience of my life and I want that back. I want that experience back. And one of the first questions I ask these people is, how is your connection with Allah? How is your Qiyam al-Layl? When was the last time you got up in the middle of the night or in the last third of the night to pray to your Lord? And if the answer, answer usually is, well, I don't, I don't really do that. I mean, I just try to do my five daily prayers. I'm just happy if I can get that in. And I tell them, I say, listen, if you're cutting off your connection with Allah, how are you going to get better? 
You can't expect your Iman to just get fixed all of a sudden on its own. It's not going to happen. You have to take steps for you to become a better Muslim. You have to take steps to reach that level of Iman. When it comes to Qiyam al-Layl, one of the advices I often give, and I give this advice because this was the advice given to me by my teachers, is if you want to pray Qiyam al-Layl, all you have to do is just try it. And I'm not talking about spending a third of the night praying or half of the night praying. I'm saying get up 10 minutes before Fajr. Just 10 minutes before Fajr. And we know the Prophet told us that it is the last third of the night where Allah comes down to the lowest parts of the heaven and he asks, he says, which one of my servants is seeking my forgiveness that I may forgive them? And which one of my servants is seeking my mercy that I may be merciful, merciful for them? Which one of my servants is asking of me that I may give to them? And that, that third of the night is still there in the last 10 minutes before Fajr. So all I'm saying is wake up 10 minutes before Fajr. Not an hour, not two hours before Fajr, 10 minutes before Fajr. And try and, and, and pray Qiyam al-Layl. And experience this amazing spiritual nature that Allah Azza wa has given us. This blessing that Allah Azza wa has given us. And when you get up in the night, number one, you'll see your heart transform. You'll feel your heart unlike you've ever felt it before. And I know a lot of us, and this is a problem which is very, very common, where we look at Islam and all we see is a bunch of things we have to do. And, and we're missing that spiritual side of Islam. We're missing that connection with Allah and our Creator. And I tell you that if you're seeking that connection, then get up and pray Qiyam al-Layl. You will see your heart transform. You will see this tranquility and peace that Islam is supposed to be. You know, people talk about Islam. Islam means peace and all that kind of stuff. If you will really want to experience that, get up in that last third of the night. Get up for 10 minutes and you will see that peace and tranquility descend upon you. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam said Whoever builds a masjid for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will build for him a house in paradise. Dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The upcoming mosque project in Adelaide, South Australia is an excellent opportunity for you to build a house in paradise. Islamic practice and Dawa cycle Incorporated IPDC is going to establish a masjid and multicultural center in Adelaide. IPDC is a non-profit organization registered with Australian government operating in all major cities Australia-wide. It has established many multicultural, religious and educational institutions such as Melbourne Multicultural Center at Victoria, IPDC Center at St. Mary's, New South Wales, Masjid Ea Rahman at Slacks Creek, Queensland, Lakemba Islamic Center at New South Wales, Armadal Masjid and Islamic Center at Western Australia, Islamic School of Canavera. The current project is located in Virginia, north of Adelaide, CBD. Virginia is one of the fastest growing suburbs in Adelaide. Many Muslim communities work and live around the area. The name of the project is South Australia Multicultural Center and Virginia Masjid. Inshallah, the mosque will benefit the Muslims around the area as well as people living in Greater Adelaide as its plan includes full-fledged masjid and dawa center, Muslim function center, community gathering and learning program, youth hub, child care center and aged care facilities, 
Al Tatkir Institute of South Australia. Social counseling services, food bank, and many more. The initial cost is going to be $500,000. To build this masjid, we need your generous participation and support. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, spend in the way of Allah and do not throw yourselves with your own hands into destruction by refraining. And to good, indeed, Allah loved the donors of good. Surah Baqarah 195 Please donate generously and make dua for this project. Account name Virginia Masjid, South Australia BSB 083004 Account number 728776899The month where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increases our wealth. The month where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increases our thawab. I am hoping to receive your help. My brothers and sisters, we are looking for only 1,000 generous hearts to donate $500 in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be part of this amazing masjid in the Virginia area in Adelaide. We all know my brothers and sisters, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam was generous. But during the blessed month of Ramadan, he was even more generous. Let us not forget the oath that Rasulullah took where he said, Wallahi ma naqasa malu min sadaqah. That by Allah, charity never decreased the wealth of an individual. And let us also remember the words of Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala. Ma indakum yanfadu wa ma indallahi baq. Whatever we have will perish. But whatever we leave with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is everlasting. Whatever you are going to contribute towards the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, know that it will protect you in the grave and it will be your shade on the day of Qiyamah, inshallah. My brothers and sisters, we want you to be part of this amazing masjid project in Adelaide in the city of Virginia. Please give for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never breaks his promise. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. And so there is, and, and you know, and unfortunately they're being misrepresented. But then there's also some of the cultural customs that people come with that becomes, um, that becomes abusive. And mm. or they may not have an extended family that can become a buffer. You know, and often in countries of origin, you've got large extended families and they share in the role of parenting and they're a support emotionally and so on and so forth. When people come over here, they become isolated. Isolation is a big killer when it comes to the issues of domestic violence and if I, if I just I just wanted to just show you something yeah, yeah, why not? Sure. if we look at this this is like some of the different types of violence that we can look at and if I, and within that in and the way why I have it as an umbrella is like domestic violence is like an umbrella and and these are those dot the drops that you can see are the different types of violence and they are like acid you mm. know in a relationship so they actually kill relationships because they um, so you've got financial abuse, you've got verbal abu abuse, sexual abuse, physical abuse, you've got um, emotional, spiritual, social abuse are different forms of violence that exist and what ends up happening is it really corrodes the family system and it is something that doesn't do any positive to a, to a, you know, to a kind of a family relationship and actually goes against some of the main ingredients of what faith talks about. When uh, we find within the Quranic context, uh, Allah talks about a relationship having muadda, rahma, and sakina. What that means is muadda is um, unconditional love, mm -hmm. rahma is mercy, and sakina is the tranquility. So, when a relationship doesn't have that, whatever relationship we're talking about, whether it be child with a parent or a spousal or siblings or grandparents and grandchild or whatever, if it doesn't have these ingredients, then it's actually transgressing the boundaries that God has set. And so this goes back to that issue of misrepresenting text.
and thank you very much. I think it's very good. Uh, your knowledge on this is very nice, mashallah. Uh, what is actually the responsibility of us? I mean, in general, not I'm saying myself or yourself in general. Yep. What's the responsibility of community, imams? We have uh, community leaders, mashallah. There are lots of people who are actually acting as um, community leaders, and uh, they are community leaders, obviously, but uh, what is what is their responsibility in their job? What I wanted to say in that is like, I think there is a thing where, I think our responsibility is collective. Yeah. So what we need to do is we have to be taking on, if we look at it as uh, we bring this issue into a lake, you know, so the community is like a lake. For the community to go, to flow together uh, in like a lake kind of setting, um, we need to work collectively to look at issues related to how do we resolve this problem? How do we address uh, the issue of, uh, how do we support emotionally people who are perpetrators as well as victims and the community at large? Because this issue of domestic violence doesn't only impact on that particular family members, it actually impacts on the community itself mm -hmm. as well. And it goes above that. Because when someone is going through some form of trauma or pain or whatever, what ends up happening is that it has ripple effects. And it's like a lake, when you throw a stone in there, it will have the ripple effect on how it flows, right? So uh, depending on how big that stone is. And so here, when you're looking at this issue of community responsibility, we need to look at, like I said, how do we resolve this issue? How do we um, to, uh, pull our resources to work together? You can't do this alone. We have to actually work together on this. And we also look at this issue of healing. If someone is going through domestic and family violence, they need to heal both the perpetrator as well as the victim. The perpetrator so they don't continue to do that and the victim so that they do not fall onto those relationships again. And what we're looking at as well is that what does healing look like? Because for every person healing will look a bit different and it will depend on the experiences. How do we validate that? How does the community become the support structure? You know there's a hadith of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him that says that um, we as an ummah are like a building. If one of the pillars is wobbly and it will fall apart, you know, the whole building will fall mm. apart. So this is how we should be viewing this. It's not a woman's issue. Unfortunately, when it comes to domestic and family violence, it becomes a woman's issue. It isn't. It's actually both um, uh, men, women, community, the leaders, everyone has got a responsibility towards this. We have a responsibility to find ways on how do we eradicate this in a functional way where we can make it more um, that it becomes a community responsibility, community coordinated response and in that way what that requires is upskilling. So it requires that Imams have got um, you know, they've got like skills on, unfortunately sometimes like we don't realize that Imams are stretched like a rubber band and that they need, they need also support. They need to know how are we able to refer, when do we refer, you know, and there's so many services out there and imams can be doing certain things and after that being able to refer it to people who've got expertise in the area, whether they be services for like housing or finance, whether it be, uh, if it's an issue of safety, obviously the police come in, if there's an issue of a court, where do you, where, at what point can you refer? And in that way, it also reduces the burden of the imams. And so one of the programs that I look at is, um, is this thing about how do we upskill community leaders as well as imams on being able to be empathetic to the victims as well as holding the um, offender responsible, but at the same time supporting them as well and supporting the family. Mm -hmm. So we've gone to do some of these programs on also healing for victims of violence. Like I said, healing looks so different for each person. How do we do it where it's culturally and religiously appropriate to us as a community is, is essential. Yes, Marshall. I mean, when you're coming to the topic of the imams, that's going to be a big topic again, isn't it? Because yes. some of the masajids are actually, uh, imams are coming for a few months or a few even a year or so and then they, they disappear and then some other imam is coming, some massages obviously. Yeah. Some of them are permanent imams which yeah. uh, I think is a very good idea. Yeah. Can I, can I raise a point over there? One of the things that, um, this is a few years ago that I did, one of the imams from Brisbane, he, had, he was going to be doing a sermon on domestic violence for Friday khutbah. So he sent me um, the set of like uh, questions that he was going to, or statements he was posing. And what I did, because I'm an expert on domestic violence and I kind of like go, how are you going to word that? There's often, or sometimes what ends up happening is like an imam might be saying something in a khutbah and he uses the words in a way that almost seems like, he, like it is uh, condoning domestic violence and so how you're using the words is so important 
And unfortunately, what we end up seeing is there is this thing called the tip of the iceberg. Oh, yes. You know, you've, yeah, you've yeah. probably seen this. Yeah, yeah. So what with the tip of the iceberg, what you find is like the physical violence, all of the types of violence is really at the tip. Underneath it, there's so many different issues. So we have to ask ourselves as a community, are we doing things like um, promoting sexist jokes and you know gender inequality uh, are we or gender inequity are we promoting things like you know um, there's this power imbalances between um, family members or things like that mm. obviously there are things where there will be like um, you know certain certain like for example a parent might have a bit more responsibility uh, compared to say someone who is uh, not a, a child for example so there is a responsibility but then the pa there is a thing related to the respect that comes within in that relationship so um, they, I was just reading something uh, yesterday where the Rasulullah he said in a hadith he goes in our community we should have the respect for our elders and the support for the for those who are younger mm -hmm. and he demonstrated that in relationships you'd see you know the hadith is replete with those kind of examples and so we need to be able to demonstrate that in our own families as well um, I think our time is getting very, very short. I mean, it's, uh, I, I know it's, uh, if, you, if you discuss on, on, on this topic, every single word you're saying, there is some questions coming in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> it's a huge topic. Isn't it? I mean, just, I don't want to go too deep on that, obviously. Hopefully, inshallah, we have some other time to discuss on this. Uh, but I just want to know, as an expert, as a, someone who has a study on this, is obviously PhD, what is the strategies? What, what sort of strategies you're thinking that it can improve the life of our community? You know, the life of our our women or men or whoever actually are under domestic violence, and this somehow that plans or what is the best way to, to reach to this? Okay, some of the things that I'm I call it Mecca, N E W C R, and I've said that deliberately. So some of the things that families can be doing is maintaining uh, daily family schedule. So this could be things that you do as a family. You could be doing involved in praying together. Mm -hmm. You could be doing things like a project together. And unfortunately, sometimes we don't realize that you know, engaging kids and family members in projects is so important. So you could be choosing like a Ramadan project, for example, or like a yearly project that you could be doing. Recreation is also part of that. So what are some of the daily activities that we are doing? The other thing about E is looking at the emotional well-being of every family member is so important so supporting them what are the kind of support structures do they need to be mentally um, healthy what are some of the stresses that are there and how can you address it as a family that takes me to this third point of conflict resolution strategy if you have a conflict that emerges where there's differences of opinion what are you going to do as a conflict strategy for your family work on it together to be able to establish a conflict uh, resolution strategy for your family so that you can address a conflict that the moment it emerges because when something is not addressed early on it actually festers and blows up at, at a certain stage so that then takes me to the issue of a communication strategy what is your communication communica communication strategy one of the things that I will say is if in your family you are using silent treatment please stop that is not a strategy that you should be using in your silent family. Silent treatments, what is that? Can silent you this is one of the questions. <laughs> silent treatment is something where someone would give you the cold shoulder. Instead of discussing with you what the issue is, they'll actually give you, they, want, they don't want to talk to you about it. Oh, okay. So they, they're going to this silent what treatment. What they call my, my kids, they like cross, cross from each other? Yeah. Being crossed yeah. from each other? So yeah, and then yeah. they'll like not talk to each other. And yeah. what ends up happening is they expect you to understand what is the problem through wahi, revelation. We're like, there's no yeah, revelation, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. So it's like, I'm not going to understand it unless you tell me what is the issue, what has happened. And you can be doing, and one of the strategies that you can use for communication is open-ended questions. So you ask those questions like, uh, you know, about what, how, why, you know, those kind of things. So you, you, you try to tease out what is it, what happened. So you establish your communication strategies. For example, I'll give you an example. One of the things that I did with my brother when we used to go into conflict was I used to, I'm the kind of person that if I get angry about something or get upset about something, leave me alone for a while. Don't mm -hmm. come and start nagging me. So I established that with my brother, I go, uh, and we actually sat and sorted this out and we're like, uh, do this so that we have if I get angry just leave me for a while and then I will come to you and I'll talk to you about it so that's what I'm talking about and the last thing is about um, responsibility over rights so look at focus on your responsibility in a relationship rather than this is my right because when you are 
focused on rights, it always becomes a conflict. But when you're talking about what is my responsibility, automatically you will get your rights. And of course, you know, review this plan um, every now and then. So you set up a strategy. And that's an important part of developing healthy family relationships. MashaAllah. Uh, for the, uh, uh, tonight or today program, uh, doctor, I mean, but thank you very much for coming tonight and uh, may Allah give you lots of rewards for this all Ameen. work you're doing and Ameen. inshallah you have a, a great rest of month of Ramadan. Inshallah. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah. Here we are, Ramadan is departing and we don't know we have done good or not. The Prophet ﷺ used to put double the effort in the last 10 nights of Ramadan. So we have these 10 nights coming towards us. One of these nights is the night of Al-Qadr. We need to really do our best in order to reach that night and do well in that night. If we were praying one rak'ah of Witr during the 20 days of Ramadan, the Prophet ﷺ prayed three, and sometimes prayed five, and even some narrations, he prayed 13. So let's put the effort in order to pray more, to do more in the last 10 nights of Ramadan. If we were doing dua, five minutes, 10 minutes every day during the first 10 days of Ramadan, let's make it half an hour. Let's make it one hour of dua. Let's feel connected to Allah Azza wa Jal. If we are praying tahajjud before fajr, two rak'ahs, four rak'ahs for half an hour, let's make it an hour. Let's make it two hours. Let's do our best. And as a reminder, when Aisha radiallahu anha said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what shall I do if I am in the night of Al-Qadr? So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to her, well, say Aisha, Allahumma inna ka'afuun tuhibbu al-afwa fa'afu anna. Let's make that as our daily habit. We say that, Allahumma inna ka'afuun, tuhibbu al-afwa fa'afu anna, every day. So any night, the night of Al-Qadr was, from the last 10 nights of Ramadan, we have done our best. This way, inshallah, we will be forgiven during this Ramadan. In the hadith, Jibreel came to the Prophet وسلم, and said to him, he's a loser who enters Ramadan and will not be forgiven. May Allah make us from all who are going to be forgiven during the month of Ramadan. Let's do our best in the last 10 nights. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Ramadan, 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 Ramadan. Oh Ramadan, oh Ramadan, month of mercy you are, welcome Ramadan. Oh Ramadan, oh Ramadan, month of mercy you are, welcome Ramadan. Ramadan, 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 oh Ramadan. Ramadan, Allah of mercy you are, welcome Ramadan. Oh Ramadan, oh Ramadan, Ramadan. Allah of mercy you are, welcome Ramadan. Allah. I 
أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح حي على الصلاة خير من النوم الصلاة خير من النوم الله أكبر الله أكبر اللهم رب هذه الدعوة التامة والصلاة القائمة آت محمدا الوسيلة والفضيلة وابعثه مقاما إنك لا تخلف الميعاد الله أكبر الله أكبر Alhamdulillah, we are so delighted, so happy to be in this beautiful masjid being financed, donated by one of our lovely sisters. Ya Allah. The moment that all these children have been waiting for for so long, as they've been seeing this masjid being put up, been built, and now finally, alhamdulillah, it's completed. And we have just opened this masjid here, and these children are eager to come here, to be the first to step into this masjid here, to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right here in their town, where they haven't had the opportunity to have a masjid in the here. 
And what we have been told that these amazing children here, so far they have memorized just Amma and they say they are so eager and they are so happy to be in this masjid here and inshallah you're looking at many huffat to come bi ta'ala. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless Hajj Ayyam and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept this beautiful donation from here and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant here paradise inshallah ta'ala. So one of the beautiful things about building a masjid is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you heaps of rewards. Allah, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that if it builds a masjid at the size of a bird's nest, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will build for him a house in paradise, in Jannah. And what's beautiful is that you will also have a plaque written with your name on it once the masjid is completed. One of the only good deeds that will reach you once you pass away is a sadaqah jariyah or beneficial knowledge or a son, a obedient son who keeps on doing dua for you. So subhanAllah, a sadaqah could also be a cure. So this masjid is considered many types of sadaqah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you for every single person who prays in here. So I encourage you and I urge you, build a masjid for you, a loved one, someone who's sick so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could cure them or for someone who's passed away so that they could keep receiving these good deeds until the day of judgment. This is a moment where they all come together and inshallah, being the first and it wouldn't be the last that we can see this masjid bring back to life with many amazing people that pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with them. Rahmatullah. Wishing all our dearest brothers and sisters a blessed Ramadan. Imagine for a moment that your mother, daughter, father or son was taken away from you by the government for owning a copy of the Qur'an, for fasting, for praying, for saying the simple greeting of Assalamu Alaikum. How would you feel? Our Uyghur Refugee Appeal provides urgent support for victims of the ongoing genocide with life necessities such as food, shelter, education and medical aid. Visit our website at sugarfoundation.org.au Welcome to the Old Bazaar Market. During Ramadan and every day of the year, we provide a large variety of services to the community. At the Old Bazaar Market, we have a masjid where Taraweeh prayers will be held every night. There are many halal food vendors for iftar, as well as clothes, jewelry, gift and Islamic shops. For your peace of mind, we have a fully supervised playhouse and trampoline park for kids. There is also a large community hall for weddings and functions. Our goal is to provide a family-friendly entertainment center for all ages and cultures. We are open 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. every single day of the year. I see the red of my mother's love, the true blue of my father's hugs. I see the orange of my sibling's smile. I see the pink and the white of the love of my life and the deep, deep green that all children bring are the coolness of my eyes. For Allah has given me a cotton candy sky, a little bit of blue, pink, Purple and white I sometimes see the gray And I sometimes feel the rain But I'll see the colors of the cotton candy sky again Whenever I am down I look up to the sky And I see the signs from Allah Most high, most of all I see light Endless light upon light Mercy from Allah who is yours and mine Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Rabbil Alameen Bismillah, and again I begin Allah has given me a cotton candy sky A little bit of blue, pink, purple and white 
I sometimes see the gray and I sometimes feel the rain But I'll see the colors of the cotton candy sky again For Allah has given me a cotton candy sky A little bit of blue, pink, purple and white I sometimes see the gray and I sometimes feel the rain But I'll see the colors of the cotton candy sky again